I was standing on the banks of the river Looking out over life's troubled sea When I saw an old ship that was sailing Is that the old ship of Zion I see? At the stern of the ship was the captain. I could hear as he called out my name. Get on board, it's the old ship of Zion. It may never this way again as I step on board I'll be leading all my troubles and trials behind I'll be safe with Jesus the captain sailing out on the old ship of Zion sailing out on the old ship of Zion Good morning. We welcome you to this Sunday's devotional uh, from the South Church of Christ in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Our study this morning is going to be on the mirror of God's Word. Uh, second uh, chapter, first chapter of James, verses 22 through uh, 25. And we will uh, be getting to that passage in a little uh, I do want to read a passage to start this morning, 2 Timothy, the third chapter, verses 10 through 17. Uh, chapter 3, verses 10. But you have followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, love, perseverance, persecution, afflictions, which happened to me at Andy. Iconium at Lystra, what persecution heard, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yet, and all who do live godly in Christ Jesus will persecution. And pastors first, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for through faith, which is in Christ. Given by inspiration of God and is profitable for reproof, for correction, for righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know, in this letter to Timothy, in this particular passage, Paul reminds us, first of all, of his of life, and it included a lot of different things. It included, first of all, he listed uh, the things that Paul taught, the things that he wrote. We might ask, what doctrine is he talking about? Well, certainly the doctrine of of the gospel, Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. But all the things that taught in various places were part of his doctrine. But notice that his manifested itself in life, in his manner of life, in the things that he suffered and endured as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So all of these areas 
Paul is encouraging Timothy, and we should be reminded too. And I think this season that we're going through now, we've been reminded that the church is more than just a building. More even than just our assembling together, although we miss that uh, very much of getting together. Yet the church is our, we are, we are in his feet to minister to those around us. So in, in all of these, uh, Paul is encouraging Timothy to remember his doctrine and his manner of life and all of the things that uh, that he, he did. In uh, Charles Colson's book, On God, he devotes one chapter to a brief description of the life and conversion of Augustine. He comments on Augustine's view of the scripture before and after his conversion. Colson writes prior his conversion, Augustine thought the scriptures a collection of texts that must be interpreted and revised in comparison to the advanced wisdom of the philosophers. But in the garden, he saw the scriptures not just words to be interpreted, they were words that interpreted their reader. Through scripture, God spoke personally and inerrantly to him. And as God's voice, Scripture knew infinitely more about Augustine than Augustine knew about Scripture. Various texts inform us of this truth which Augustine discovered. God's knowledge of us is far greater than our knowledge of Him. God knows more about us than we know about ourselves. Thus, His Word can illuminate life for us. It can reveal to us important truths about our fears, about our hopes, and about our ambitions. God's word can show us who we really are. There are many people today who still believe that we should revise the scriptures in light of current philosophy. Recent changes in the churches in America reflect this approach. The pressures of by women's rights groups have led some church leaders to scrap the biblical texts that restrict a woman's role in church assemblies. The advice of modern church growth experts has persuaded many churches to change their names, review their worship services, and distance themselves as far as possible from any traditional doctrine or practices. When one surveys the current religious scene, in America, he sees churches in a turmoil of division and restructuring. Despite the confusion on the religious scene, God's word still accurately describes man and pinpoints his vulnerabilities. James likens the word of God to a mirror, perfectly reflecting every feature of the aspect of man. This image is couched in a passage of exhortation in which James encourages us to control our anger and to control our tongue. We read from James 1, verses 19 through 25. James said, Therefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and the overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For as a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. I think it is significant that James points to weakness in this passage. One of the hallmarks 
of man's continually de uh, continual departures from God has been an arrogant attitude. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 14 and verse 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Surely pride is the root of any departure from God's word. We know better than God. We know more than God. This was an issue in the very first departure from God's word. It was a lie, and Satan knew he was lying when he told Eve, you shall not surely die. Satan further told Eve that if she would eat the forbidden fruit, that she would be a God himself. Modern departures for God are no different than the original. They are based on lies and pride. One example of this process is the Jim Jones cults of some time back. Remember, Jim Jones was a leader of a religious group that claimed to be led by God and his word. However, Jim Jones decided that there were some things in the Bible that changed. Undeniable that Jones persuaded a lot of people to make some great sacrifices to the Lord. They were turning over their entire livelihood to the temple. How could anyone fault a religious group that displayed such devotion and such sacrifice? The only way that anyone could question this group is on the basis of the word. Jones began teaching that the men in the church should not have normal sexual relations with their wives. And is this not an open contradiction to what God's word teaches? In Hebrews 13, verse 4, we read, Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers God will judge. In contradiction to this same passage, Jones instituted a practice of sexual relationship with the wives of the men in his church. I suppose that one would have to conclude that Jones had some new the word, word adultery means. This is a very example from God's word. But any time we redefine the Bible to suit our we are guilty of pride and lying. When we decide that certain parts of God's word no longer apply to us, we open the door for every kind of evil that our selfish pride can devise. What Augustine finally discovered was that God's word showed him exactly who he was. This is a truth that is obvious even to the casual reader of the Bible. John writes in John 2, verses 24 and 25, but Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man. He knew what was in man. King David was led to confess, against you, you only, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Psalm verse 4. We know it is God's word that will judge us in the last day. For Jesus said in John 12, 48, he, re he who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in that last day. In view of these evident truths from the Bible, it is dangerous to depart from God's word. When we become so proud that we think we know more than the inspired writers, we may be on the brink of self-deception that will lead to our destruction. God's word is a mirror that shows us who we are in the light of God's truth. Have you ever been in a house of mirrors on a, you know, at a carnival or fair. It can be a very scary experience. You know, some of the mirrors make you look short and some make you look tall and others make you look crooked or they may make your head look as if it's, if it's uh, disconnected from the rest of your body. You know, what is the truth? 
Well, the truth is that someone had been tampering with those mirrors and made them reflect a false image. If you want a true image of yourself, you first find a mirror that is built to certain standards, and then you will know what you really look like. Sometimes men choose to ignore the image reflected by the standard of God's word. They have no intention of listening to God, and fools that they are, they will not be bound by any standards imposed by someone else. He not himself. They are especially opposed to servants of God who exhort and them from the Bible. In fact, their desire is to totally obliterate the Bible and ban it from the face of the earth. There are other men who do not like certain restrictions that the Word of God places. Like the carnival mirrors, they want to distort God's word so that it will accommodate their wishes and their desires. People to believe that they still follow the Bible, but they have rejected the real image reflected to them by God's word. They are hearers, but not doers of the word. In fact, they become distorters of the word. And like the original distorter, they often cite passages and then say, is that really what God said? Surely God didn't mean that. We know better than that. This is what God must have really meant to say. What we need to understand is exactly what Augustine had discovered. The Bible is not a bunch of words that need to be interpreted in light of the philosophies of modern man. The Bible is the word that fully interprets who man is. The Bible is the mirror that actually accurately reflects the image of man's spiritual self. And so it behooves us not only to be hearers, but to be doers of the word. And we'll conclude the uh, study there this morning. I hope it's been that we encouraging and helpful to you as we think about how God's Word is really a mirror that will properly reflect who we are in His sight. At this time in our uh, devotion this morning, we want to take and pause for a minute and observe the Lord's Supper. So those of you that have those elements uh, ready and want to participate in this with us today, we'll invite you to do that at this time. First of all, we'll take the bread. and We remember that the Lord instituted this supper on the night of his betrayal. And he has admonished us that as often as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we shall his death until he comes again. Let's offer thanks for the bread. Father, we do thank you for the wonderful sacrifice that you made on Calvary for all of us. And we pray that we would properly respond to you and to your word and to your invitation. And as we remember you and your death as we take this bread we pray that we will do so in a way that is pleasing to you and it will be strengthening and beneficial to us in the name of Jesus we pray amen After the bread, Jesus took the cup, and at this time we'll offer thanks for the, for the cup. Father, we also thank you for this cup that represents to us the blood that Christ shed, and we remember the cruel pain that he suffered, the things that he went through, and the shedding of his blood. 
We pray that this would always be uh, kept in our minds, that we would always remember the great sacrifice that you've made for us. And as we take this cup, we pray that we would be remembering the things that you went through to purchase our salvation. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, we'll close with a prayer in just a minute. Before that prayer, as we're beginning another week, still kind of in isolation for the most part, maybe some areas are beginning to try to open up a little. We pray that you'll have a, a blessed week this week and that uh, the Lord will open up opportunities for you uh, to be a servant to others around you. Or as we mentioned, excuse me, earlier in Paul's writing to Timothy, not only was it his doctrine that he wanted Timothy to remember, but that doctrine manner of life in the way that uh, he conducted himself. So, as the church, that's what it means for us to be the church. It's not just not just coming together in assemblies, although that's part of it. And we miss that part of it right now. But it's our everyday life and our service as we go out and minister in the world. Bow with me as we pray. Father, we do thank you, first of all, for Jesus and for his willingness to come to this earth, to take upon himself the form of the flesh, to suffer in the flesh as we do, and finally, to give himself as a sacrifice for our sins. And we, th we thank you for your word, Father, that uh, points us to the cross. And that reminds us of who you are, and of the fact that you are our creator. And all the ways in which you have blessed our lives. And may we uh, hide your word in our hearts, Father. And may it be a constant guide and a compass for us as we sojourn here upon the earth, that it will give us direction, that it will also give us comfort, and that it will give us hope. Father, I pray for the nations of the world, and in particular for our nation, our leaders this week, as the decisions that affect all of us. Pray that you'll grant them wisdom. And be with, again, those doctors and nurses that others that are ministering to those that are sick. We, we pray for them and for their safety and their health as well. Continue to bless us as, we see, as you see we have need. And help us always to be mindful of the needs of others. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll uh, run a closing song and uh, yeah, Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Yeah, I know I saw that, but I didn't. I had a halo. To which I may It's fiction. Oh, yeah, Carl. No Did you get it? Goodbye. Yeah. All right. You're welcome. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Uh, I thought I had a
Sweet Beulah Land. I'm looking out across that river where my fate. Just a few more days to labor, then I will take that heavenly fly. Sweet.